An American Dilemma by Gunnar Myrtle. This is a series of books um, by Harper and Brothers, bankrolled in part by the Carnegie Corporation of New York. This is the fourth edition, 1944, printed in the United States of America uh, under a time when they had to print about government regulations for scarcity because war. Uh, today is March 1st. A dictator has invaded Ukraine and uh, yeah this book really shows us how things don't change unless we actively become the energy behind the change um, I saw this on a bookshelf and all I read was an American dilemma knowing enough history and phraseology, I was able to say, oh God, no. And when I picked it up and I looked at it and I read The Negro Problem, I definitely felt the urge to vomit. Uh, perfectly understandable and perfectly rational because the way we treat humans in this country is absolutely repugnant and repulsive. And it is something we have used to build a nation on. It is what we have made ourselves strong from. It is blood energy. It is human sacrifice, to put it a long way around. And to come at this with still the idea that this is just a dilemma or a problem, to use words after three centuries of people who for the sole reason they needed people to harvest cotton and to work on their plantations and to make them money, to make their wives look pretty and to make themselves look rich. They were able to come up with biblical reasons and Mark of Cain and all this other stuff to justify what they were doing for profit. Um, and one of the really, really important things is to never turn away from this, is to not say, I don't want to read this, we should burn this book, because that's how you lose, that's how they win, by making us unwilling and unable to look them in the face and to read their words and to use their words in a dialogue because civility is important. You don't get hot from cold, right? Two colds don't make a hot. It's just, it's just the way it is. You, one does not hunt monsters without becoming one. And the thing a lot of good people forget to account is plenty of humans are okay with becoming a monster. They like it. They profit from it. Okay? Good people, the average mass of humanity, doesn't give this part of the equation enough value. That these people will use literature and science and all these other constructs to get away with what they want. They will invent new forms of currency to stay legitimate because if money is a concept, all right, then I will use this and it'll be outside of your bounds. If slavery is a concept that initially is abhorrent to any right-thinking person, right? If you don't do it, I say, I will chop off the hands and feet of your child, right? That is abhorrent. No other creature does that. That is particularly human right? Sure, other creatures will kill each other in war for resources or mates, but just to stage an all-out war or to engage, you know, ants do some, you know, bits of farming. We call it farming. We don't know. Maybe the aphids like it, but distracted. We did not like it. There was never any point in what happens to people stolen from their homes and their lands to work for 
the American corporation because don't get me wrong, this country has always been a corporation. It has always been an industry. If you travel to other lands that have had the time to organically develop and to become a people and a culture and a thing outside of genocide and profit, then it, it, it feels full and it feels round. The first time I traveled really was uh, as a 15 year old to Russia, which is problematic, but it's also amazing because we have to remember that the individuals within a society are different many times than their leaders. Uh, there was a thread today when someone from outside of this country was like, oh, you Americans are going to fully and finally understand and see who you are. Wag, wag, wag. And I said, hold, hold, hold up. All right. That's the PR of America making you believe everybody here is some fat, happy 1950s, wealthy, white, suburban American. We've always known what this country is like. The people who lived here before this corporation landed on our soil know and have always known what America is like. It's just that you don't really, you know, let the help talk to guests because why would you do that? Because they'll tell you all sorts of embarrassing things and mention lynchings and genocides and stomping on babies and I... <sighs> so, Anyway, the whole point of today's little thing was to read from this book. Um, and I came to it expecting my own bias, my own PTSD, right? You know, uh, I've heard it said, um, you know, how, how could something that happened so long ago affect you now? And... I'm like, I wasn't there, but it is affecting me now, just as it is affecting you, a person who is not of color, who is of privilege in this country, not because of who you are, and not because of who I am, but because this is the system that this country was built upon. Our very flag was taken from the corporate concept of the East India Trading Company, which in itself abused government rights and rules to profit. It used its profit motive as a justification to brutalize India, to brutalize, you know, everybody except for its shareholders and except for the customer in so much as they could use the customer to make more money at the end of the day. People need to understand that this is America. Our flag was very much taken from their flag, right? We were like, they do awesome stuff. They're making a lot of money. Let's do what they do. Skip a step, middleman, which is the British Empire, and just become an empire of the East India Trading Company ethic. And we did that. And people forget. And we did that successfully for 300 plus years. Right? We uh, don't really talk about the apartheid of America. And we most definitely do have that. This is definitely a separate, segregate society. Um, we can use money minted before, you know, my living relatives were considered full human and given the full rights of a citizen. So, anyway, back to the book. <laughs> um, he says it is the most comprehensive report on the Negro. We're going to have to get used to that word because they say it a lot. They say a lot of other words, but in the context of history, it is important and I will do my best. I, history. It is the outgrowth of five years study sponsored by the Carnegie Corporation. As Dr. Frederick P. Keppel explains in his foreword, it was understood that Dr. Myrtle as editor should be fruit free to appoint and organize a staff of his own selection in the United States, and that he should draw upon the experience of other scholars and experts in less formal fashion. They got drunk and talked together. But that the report is finally drawn up and presented to the public should represent and portray his own decisions alike in the selection of data and in the conclusions as to their relative importance. Upon him rested the responsibility 
and to him should go the credit for what I believe one remarkable accomplishment. This encyclopedic study, remember, and I actually just got this one, characteristics of the American Negro, should be fun. Thank God I don't drink. <sighs> so this one talks about such matters as the Negro's participation in American economic life, political life, relations with the law, matters of social status and leadership. And the Negro institutions and community expressions are among the topics considered. However, if you would look at one, you must look at the other. So the introduction of this text uh, is fascinating because he himself is not an American, he's a European. And he comes here trying to understand, which to him is an American dilemma, right? His dilemma, he starts out with the American pattern of individual leadership and mass passivity. Right. So mass passivity, that's the thing that was written into America from the beginning. You know, we talk about three fifths, right? Yeah, sure. But a lot of people need to understand that unless you were one of, and he actually talks about the 1%. I don't know how old that is, but he does re refer to 99% of Americans being these passive people who simply look to a leader uh, and trust that this leader will do the best and the right thing for them. Um, I'll just stop this one and then just start the next one reading because this is super long. Uh, but overall, I had to agree with that. I'm like, yes, a lot of Americans eschew their responsibility of enlightenment and in education and selecting somebody aside from, oh, hey, he's popular. I don't know what this is making me think of. Uh, and then he goes on to say that he is very glad that the American checks and balances and voter protection system is in place and working because otherwise this country would surely slide into fascism with all of the cultish ideation and idolatry that we have for our leaders, which he says is very unique to this country, right? We've always liked the boss man. Uh, and then part of it does go on to an examination of the relations between uh, black folk and southerners. And he is actually uh, not as kind as you might think to the northerners, which if you ask someone in the know, they would be like, oh, hell yeah, they were just as bad, you know, to black folks as they were in the south, except in the south, they had been doing this for centuries, centuries and they were a little bit better at it. And in a lot of ways, they felt uh, that the Northerners were worse to black people and more rude because they just didn't get them, I guess. Um, yeah, great book. So um, I'll go have some tea and then I'll start reading a couple pages. There's a lot here that I did just sort of set aside as it would be interesting to read, but I highly recommend you go find this for yourself. It's about 68 to 80 bucks in print. Um, this is a fourth edition, um, old school, which, you know, I like. I'm just, it, it's a kink, you know? Oh, the self-righteousness and bigotry. Um, anyway, see you soon.